will give me the same error message again. You are already sharing an application, a web browser, your screens, another computer, and I cannot share my thing. I don't know why I'm keeping. Um, I think you have two instances of WebEx open. Yeah, what? I'm watching you through one instance of WebEx. And I'm okay. watching you share a screen and open a second instance. Okay, so so what do you suggest I do? We can, oh, see your screen. we can see your screen right now. Yeah, we can see your screen now. So you can, can start. You my PowerPoint? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, let me see. Okay, maybe I can start lecturing now then, since uh, we already lost about half an hour. Um, so let's start. Um, this actually is... Um, Let me go and find desktop ECE. So, can you see my screen now? Hello? Yes. Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, sorry about this. I don't know what happened. Now. And so I'd like to quickly go over the first lecture. Uh, the first lecture essentially uh, asked the question why we want to study electro uh, why why we want to study electromagnetic theory. I'm sorry, I'm a bit shaken up by this uh, this high tech thing. Okay. So why do we want to study electromagnetic theory uh, after 150 years? Okay, welcome to the course, everybody. So electromagnetic field theory, uh, now described by Maxwell's equations, have been around for over 150 years. And the reason why we want to uh, study this theory is that this theory is valid over a vast length scale and over a broad frequency range. The theory is valid from subatomic dimension to galactic dimension. It's valid from static to ultraviolet. Okay? And uh, another very important thing about uh, electromagnetics is that it's relatively invariant, which means that uh, it's valid in all inertial frames. If you are in the rocket ship moving close to the speed of light, or if you are staying on Earth, all the Maxwell's equations that we have are the same, irrespective of which inertial frame you are in. There's a third point. Okay? The fourth point is that uh, Maxwell's equations are valid in the quantum regime as well. And that was proved by the Dirac in 1927. Okay, and many of the things that we do in classical electromagnetics, like the added Green's function, is still valid in the quantum regime. And for instance, um, coherent state in quantum optics won this person, uh, Roy Glauber, a Nobel Prize in 2005. And furthermore, you can connect Maxwell's equations and the electromagnetic theory with differential forms in Young Mills theory. And I wouldn't elaborate on this. And also, uh, Maxwell's equations or electromagnetic theory has been validated to a few parts in a trillion recently. And it has tremendous impact in engineering, as you can see. Can you see my new slide, please? Hello? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, yes. good. So, electromagnetic theory has impacted many, many different areas. I actually will give you the lecture notes. Okay, the lecture notes would talk about this in greater detail. And then let me give you a brief history of electromagnetics and optics. In the beginning, it was thought that electricity and magnetism, which is what you see on the left-hand column, is quite different from optics, which is what you see on the right-hand column at the top here. Can you see my cursor, please? Yeah, so you can see your cursor. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, at first it was thought that these two were different fields, 
but then uh, Maxwell's equation was established in 1865, and with Maxwell's equations, it's discovered that electricity and magnetism, which is the left-hand column here, is actually the same law of physics as, as in optics. Okay, so when this was discovered, then many mathematicians come on the bandwagon and study Maxwell's equations as a mathematics problem. And all these are the heroes that uh, uh, preceded us in this study. And then in 1927, Dirac further showed that uh, you can extend electromagnetic theory to the quantum world. And this gives rise to a whole slew of new electromagnetic technology. And what is currently very hot is the fact that we can make nanotechnology or nanofabrication. Nanofabrication is actually amazing because you can make transistors of the order of the size of 10 nanometer. 10 nanometer is much, much smaller than the virus. If you think about the coronavirus or something like that order, I think the coronavirus is about 100 uh, nanometer. And we humans can make things much smaller than a virus right now. A virus is much smaller than the human biological cell. So you have the right order of magnitude as to how things go. And now you can detect very weak uh, electromagnetic signal. You can measure signals down to a single photon level, and that includes uh, doing this in microwave frequency, and that gave rise to the field of quantum optics and nano optics. And then around 1980s, it was shown that quantum theory has a very peculiar form, and because of that, uh, it gives rise to quantum information in around 1980, and now quantum electromagnetics and optics are the thing that are emerging. Okay, let me see uh, what I want to show next is the fact that uh, so we start with Maxwell's equations. Let me. I like to write on this uh, thing now. Okay, we start with uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, And the first Maxwell equation that we start with is Faraday's law, which essentially says that E dot dl over a closed contour C is minus D dt of over uh, surface F D dot dx. The, sorry, the, 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 the contour is not close here. This is not close. So it should be just this over here. And what it says is that if you have a loop, and then if you were to take the integration of the loop, and this loop is defined by the contour C, and if you were to do E dot dl, and there would be fluxus B, okay, fluxus B that uh, is captured by this loop, and E is some electric field that goes around this contour, and you can show that this equality is satisfied, and this is known as uh, Ampere's, uh, Faraday's law. In Faraday's law, we assume that the BDT is not equal to zero, and you will get a voltage. You get a voltage at this gap over here, okay? And you can make this loop into multi-loops, and hence, if this has been linked by a magnetic flux P, it can actually produce a larger voltage over here, okay? This is uh, Faraday's law. I'm sure that you have had some exposure to this Faraday's law in your undergraduate course. The next thing to see is actually Ampere's law. Ampere's law states the fact that if I have a magnetic field and if I integrate it over a closed contour, C, and that should be equal to the current, ds, over some surface S, plus ddt of, sorry, no, no, no close again here. So it should be something like uh, ddx, very similar to Faraday's law, but this now involves a uh, magnetic field. How do I get rid of this? 
Okay, so the last term here, as many of us know, is called the displacement current. It was not there in the original Ampere law. It was added by James Clerk Maxwell in 1865, and that completes electromagnetic theory. Okay, and what I like to talk about next is actually Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says that uh, if I have a some charge Q, and this Q will produce electric flux C, okay. And if you were to take the electric flux and integrate over this surface S, which is the closed surface, you do a closed surface integral. It should be equal to the charge Q inside. Okay, that is Coulomb's law. And then we have, uh, some people call this Gauss law. Okay, it's the same. Gauss law for the magnetic flux is that if you do the same thing for the magnetic flux C dot ds over a closed surface S, okay, this surface S, if there's a magnetic flux going through here, and this magnetic flux integrated over this closed surface is always equal to zero, okay? Because uh, there's no magnetic charge. No magnetic charges. And what this says is that if there's no magnetic charges, whatever flux that goes into the surface S must leave the surface S. What goes in must come out, okay? so. So let's go on to the next topic then, which is Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law was actually established quite long ago in about 1785. It says that if you have a charge Q1 and another charge Q2, there would be a force between these two charges and the direction of the force is along this unit vector R12. R12 is the vector that points from uh, position 1 to position 2. And Coulomb's law says that there's a force that points one from charge 1 to charge 2. And that force is proportional to the amplitude of these two charges divided by 4 pi epsilon r. Okay. Um, so it should be R square, and then the direction of the force is R12 hat, okay? Since you can also write this unit vector R12 hat as R1 minus R2, or R2 minus R1, over the magnitude of R2 minus R1, okay? This is a definition of a unit vector, and then the unit vector has the property that if you take its magnitude, uh, it's equal to 1. Okay, it's equal to 1. And hence, you can also write Coulomb's law as being equal to Q1 times Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon R1 minus R2 to the power of 3 times R2 minus R1. Okay, there's no magnitude here. And what we have is that R2 minus R1 magnitude is just a distance between the two charges. Okay, this is Coulomb's law, written in the way that it was written uh, in 18 or 1785. Okay? And we can write Coulomb's law in different ways now, in terms of electric field. So, if we have, say, a charge Q1, and then there's an incremental charge delta Q at Q2. We replace Q2 with an incremental charge, and then there will be a force that goes from Q1 to Q2 in this manner, and that force would be equal to 
Q or Q1, okay, Q times delta Q over 4 pi epsilon r square times r hat. This is just application of Coulomb's original law. However, if you relate this to the electric field, the electric field is defined to be the force that acts on an incremental amount of charge. So, an uh, incremental amount of charge multiplied by the electric field gives you the force on those uh, incremental charge. And from this, you can arrive to the fact that the electric field is defined to be the force per unit charge. So you divide the force by incremental charge, and then you get the fact that the electric field due to a small amount of incremental charge is given by this equation. So you can actually go from here to here. Okay. You can also write the electric field in terms of this more elaborate coordinate system, 4 pi epsilon r minus r prime squared. Okay? So this is just another way of saying that you write everything in uh, coordinate independent form. So if you have a charge Q, and if the charge Q is located at r prime, and if the observation point is located at r, okay, then the distance between them is given by this value. r minus r prime will be the distance between the charge location and the observation point. Okay, and then the electric field generated by that small charge Q at this location is given by this expression over here. Okay, let me see how am I doing in time. I'm trying to go faster to catch up. Okay, so what happens is that um, if you have a cluster of charges instead of just one point charge, say if you have a cluster of charges distributed uh, over all space. What is the electric field then? Uh, due to this cluster of charges, you can use the principle of linear superposition and say that the electric field hence should be the sum of the electric field from individual charges. Let's call each of them being Q sub i, and then the electric field will be given by this expression over here, 4 pi epsilon r minus r sub i q. Okay? So then we can think of qi being just one unit of the charge in this continuum, and we can assume that this charge is actually a continuum. And it's a continuum uh, defined by a charge density. Then qi at any given location can be gotten from the concept of calculus, you just evaluate the charge density at that location multiplied by the delta Vi <coughs> uh, with respect to that particular location. And hence, you can also write this to look more like a calculus integral. And then this would be rho of Ri uh, delta Vi and then it will be r minus ri over 4 pi epsilon uh, times r minus r prime q. Okay? And this essentially is an integral expression. You can write this as an integral. This can become a dv prime rho of r prime uh, r minus r prime over 4 pi epsilon r minus r prime q, okay? Where v is the volume that contains the charges, okay? Um, so this is essentially Coulomb's law, the way it was expressed in the early days when he first wrote them down. Um, then, um, then what is, uh, Coulomb's law or Gauss law that is stated differently, which is that if you were to have some charge Q, okay, and this this charge Q will produce electric flux as we said before. If you were to integrate those electric flux, uh, that equals to Q inside the surface S. And this actually 
of Coulomb's law or Gauss law here can be derived from Coulomb's law. In other words, if you go through if you go through this detail and use this to express the electric field due to these charges, you can actually derive this law. And I wouldn't derive them here, it's derived from my lecture notes. So I would let you read the lecture note and, and get to them. Okay? Um, let me let me do another thing which is that um, the the course this course has been taught Monday, Wednesday, Friday structure for a few years now. This is the first semester that they are seeming to teach on Tuesday and Thursday. So what I plan to do then is to teach one and a half lectures of the old lecture notes. And then so within the first week or every week I would uh, lecture a total of three lecture notes. So I'm, I essentially finished the first lecture note, so I'm going to go to the second uh, lecture or my lecture notes. Okay, I'm going to lecture two of my lecture notes now. And in this lecture note, what we first talked about is the integral form of Maxwell's equation. Okay, we actually have written them down in the lecture notes. The first is actually Faraday's law. And it says that if you were to integrate a closed contour around a contour C, then it should be equal to the electric flux going through the surface S. Okay, and this is just essentially what we say before this is Faraday's law. And then the second one is Ampere's law in integral form which is h dot dl equals to d dt plus the current i. So if you have a current i pairing on the wire, and then if you have electric flux d as well, <coughs> then if you define a Close contour C and then this close contour C encloses the surface S, you can apply Ampere's law and this should be the relationship that the current, the flux, and the magnetic field should satisfy. And then of course we have the third one that we have also proved that if you were to integrate the electric flux over a closed surface, it should be equal to the Q inside, and if you were to integrate the magnetic flux B over a closed surface, it should be zero, okay? So, these equations are written down in integral form, but they are actually not the most convenient form for studying. Uh, it would be more convenient to express this form in terms of differential form, or differential equation form, okay? I, I, I hate to use the word differential form because there will be confusion with another branch of electromagnetic theory. So I will call it differential operator form. Okay, I'll call it differential operator form, which means that you don't write the Maxwell's equation in integral form anymore, but not in differential form. If you say differential form, uh, then you will be confusing this with the differential geometry people. They have another way of writing down Maxwell's equation. They look quite different from what we are going to write down. Okay. So what we need to do then is to define first what the divergence operator is. What is the divergence operator? What, a, what is the curl operator? 
Okay? So if we can define what the divergence operator is and what the curl operator is, then we can rewrite Maxwell's equation in a differential operator form. And the way to do that is actually to first come up with the definition of what the divergence. If we have some electric flux D, okay, the definition of the divergence is that um, if I have this flux D, and if I multiply by delta V, okay, I, I assume that I have an incrementally small volume. If I have an incrementally incrementally small volume, and if I take the divergence of the electric flux at this point, okay, that goes to that point, it takes this divergence, and that should be equal to the measure of the electric flux that has gone through that surface. Delta S is the small surface that surrounds the delta V. Okay, there's the delta V, there's the delta S, and this is essentially the definition of what the divergence is. So you can also say that the divergence is actually the measure, the calculation of all the fluxes that go through the small surface divided by the small volume. Okay, that is the definition of the divergence. And because of this definition, uh, you can go to the math. The math is kind of long, and I've written down in great detail in the lecture note. You can show that the divergence of C in Cartesian coordinate is actually given by this expression, okay, plus partial partial y, dy plus partial partial z, dz, okay? And hence you can write, sorry, something went wrong. Hence you can write that it, you can define a Dell operator. Okay, the Dell operator would consist of three components plus Z partial partial Z. And then if you write this electric flux in Cartesian coordinate. And if you take the dot product of these two, you will get the above expression, okay? Now uh, this is in Cartesian coordinate. Okay, I will not belabor this point because I also write them down in great detail uh, in the lecture notes, and even how to derive this Dell operator. You can read them, read about them in the lecture notes, okay? Then I'd like to next um, derive Gauss theorem. Gauss theorem says that uh, if I have a divergence of a flux, and then if this is integrated over a volume C, that should be equal to the surface integration of this flux over the surface S that is enclosing uh, that volume V. Okay, this is Gauss theorem. And you can think of Gauss theorem as a consequence of the definition of what the definition of a divergence is. Since we define the divergence to be this, okay, so if we define the divergence to be this, what we can do then is to actually take any volume V and break it into small delta V. Okay, so each of this is a delta V, delta V1, delta V2, delta V3, and so on. And then it apply this identity to each of those volumes that we have. Okay, we apply this, say we take the I volume and apply this identity. And then uh, integrate the flux over that little volume and multiply or divide by delta vi, okay? So I can calculate this quantity for every one of the little volumes that I have. So what I need to do is actually to take a volume and find the flux that comes out of the volume and divide by delta, uh, delta vi. And if you do that, then what happens essentially is that you have a picture like this. 
Let's assume that these are three-dimensional boxes, but I'm only taking a cross-section of these three-dimensional boxes, so you only see two of the three dimensions. And if you were to do the flux integration over all those boxes that you see, okay, in this picture over here, the integration over the common surface that they share, the flux will cancel each other. The flux going from this side to that side cancels the flux that goes from this side to that side, and you can pay off the same for this surface and that surface. So if you add all these contributions together, only those surfaces at the end of this volume do not cancel each other. And you can argue also saying that if I were to do this integration over the entire volume, only those surfaces at the surface of this big volume remain not to be cancelled. All the interior surfaces will cancel each other in the flux, if you do the flux count. And so finally what you have is that um, as you count the fluxes through this surface, you will arrive at the fact that um, <coughs> so if I write it out mathematically, so if I were to do all this integration at the i box, and then sum over i, and that would be essentially equal to using the definition of what the divergence is, sum over all the i boxes, and then the calculation of the fluxes to every one of those boxes, when this is the delta fi for the i surface, and because all the interior uh, surfaces would have the fluxes cancel each other, then you are left with only the outermost surface, and then this integral becomes that integral and essentially you would have dv, the sum of all these fluxes and the divergences, if you measure them, that would be equal to only the contribution from the outermost surface. Okay, This is essentially Gauss divergence theorem. Okay, and so if you apply this to Gauss theorem for electric charges, which essentially says this, okay, if you apply this to Gauss theorem for electric charges, it begins with this, say, actually it says that uh, C dot ds over a closed surface S is the total charge inside Q. Okay, that's what, what Gauss theorem says for if you have a surface S that contains charge Q, then the electric flux C when you integrate over the surface equals the charge inside. Okay? And I can write Q as a consequence of the volume integration. Okay, not, not necessarily a closed volume. Okay, dv of rho of r. Okay, I can write the total charges due to the integration of the charge density inside the thing. But the left hand side, I can use Gauss divergence theorem and rewrite the right hand side as dv divergence of d. d. And then the right hand side essentially is what I have just written down. Now you can say that I can perform this integration over B, and B can be picked to be the, to be any point in space. Okay, be picked to be any point in space, and it can be picked to be very small too. I can pick my 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 B to be very very small, or B becomes delta of B. Then essentially you don't have to carry the integral with you and say that if this is always equal to each other, no matter how small B is then these two must be equal to each other. So you arrive at the equation that divergence of D must be rho of R. Okay, I can put back my R here. So this is actually Gauss law for electric field or electric flux written in differential law operator form. Okay, differential 
operator form. Okay, so so this is very interesting because what it means is that um, let me save this. So when we have integration of the electric flux over closed surface and that evaluates to zero, it means that divergence of D must be zero. Okay? And divergence of D being zero implies that whatever comes in must go out. Okay, when you have this thing being equal to zero, the physical statement you can make is that what goes in must come out. Okay, it's what it means physically. And then you can repeat the same for the other Maxwell's equation. Um, but first we have to derive identities. We have derived a Gauss theorem so far. We need to derive Stokes theorem. Okay, Stokes theorem. And what Stokes theorem says is that um, Well, be careful that a lot of European names have an S before the apostrophe, and you never say stop. Okay, this is wrong. This is wrong. You never say Huygens. This is also wrong. Okay, and many of the European names are like that, like Gauss and so on. Just remember that. Um, and also Gauss. Okay. You have to put the apostrophe after the S. And uh, so, how, what is Stokes' theorem? Stokes' theorem says that uh, we have to first define what the curl of E is. And it turns out that if you have an electric field, which is the vector field, and if you want to find its curl at any particular place, and what you need to do then is actually to define a small surface. Delta S, okay, a small surface, and then this surface is enclosed by a small contour called delta C, and then you can you can define the curl of E for this very small surface to be curl of E dot N, and let's assume that this small surface has a unit normal. Define a unit normal to be N hat, okay. Then what it says is that curl of E times delta S, just like what we did for Gauss theorem, is equal to the limit of, uh, let me see, I should say that this is approximately true for us, okay? And this is equal to um, E dot DL where E dot DL is the integration over the small contour delta C. Okay, contour delta C. And you can take that small contour and integrate it in a very small loop and evaluate the right hand side. You can also assume that you know what curl of E is. You can also evaluate the left hand side. It turns out that the definition for curl of E at the location where the loop is defined and the loop has a definition of a normal, and then you can say that this is the limiting phase where you assume that the loop becomes very small, and if you were to take this ratio, E dot DL, okay, you have this ratio, and if you work this out carefully, that gives you the definition, if you work out the right-hand side carefully, you will get the definition of what the curl of E is. And you can do that for X, Y, Z component. You can let N be, be pointing in X direction, N be pointing in the Y head direction, N be pointing in the Z head direction. And by going through this exercise, you will find that curl of E, if N is pointing in the X direction, you can evaluate the right-hand side. I'm not going to do that here, but it's done in the lecture notes. Okay. 
And then um, when you work out the detail, it's going to give you a right hand side that looks something like that, and then the Y component of this vector. Okay, this is the vector. Curl of E is the vector. This is the vector. Okay? And then this is going to be partial partial Z EX minus partial partial X EZ. Uh, partial partial X EZ, sorry. And then you can also work out the Z component of this and it will be given by uh, partial partial x ey minus partial partial y ex. Okay. But all these details are worked out in the lecture notes. Okay. And what is important to notice is that, well, if I do the same exercise again as I did before, and if I have a big contour c and a big surface s, and it, if I divide the surface s into small surface delta Si, and each of which is surrounded by delta Ci, I can apply the identity that I have just derived to each of these small loops. Okay? And again, as you can see that the interior nodes will cancel each other. Okay? The interior integration will cancel each other because if you imagine yourself integrating around one of these loops, and then the neighboring one will integrate like this, and you see that when they are uh, they're next to each other, the contour integration is going in the opposite direction, they cancel each other. And finally, if you sum up all the integration, you will only have integration on the boundary. And if you do that to a bigger surface, uh, you only have the integration on the outermost boundary remaining. So what you can see is that if you take a curl of any field, and then multiply by delta S, which is that small surface there. Sum out over all the surfaces, it will be equal to the contour integration of this thing over the larger contour C. This is called Stokes field. Okay, I think I'll stop here since I'm running over time. And sorry for the for the hiccups I had in the beginning of the lecture. Uh, I will go through that once again uh, with my student and postdoc to see if the next time we meet uh, we will not have that hiccup. Okay, and if you have suggestions as to how we can avoid the hiccup, that would be wonderful too. And I have just sent you the course outline and the questionnaire and I wish that you can uh, return the questionnaire to me and read the course outline. Okay, it turns out that this semester we have one week short compared to the previous semester. For some reason, we start a little bit late this semester. So we have to sort of squeeze materials uh, a little bit in this course in order to fit in all the previous uh, materials I've taught before. OK, are there any questions before we, we, we stop? Are there any questions on anything that you have uh, learned today? You can feel free to send me email if you have any questions. And read the lecture notes. And if you have any questions on the lecture notes, uh, send me email about them. And I also intend to give office hours. Okay, and we can either have Zoom meeting for the office hours, or we can have WebEx meeting. I think Zoom is better because Zoom, Zoom in a sense, is more flexible. Um, uh, WebEx is more rigid, but Web, WebEx has a very good advantage in the sense that. Uh, it allows you to. Yeah, any question? Uh, Professor, there's a question in chat. Um, uh, let me see. How do I get chat in WebEx? Again, it seems that I have two copies of WebEx. I don't know why. So the question is that uh, will the lectures all be online? The course description? Uh, yeah. I intend to record them and then put them online. And it turns out that I did some study. I found that it's easier to record lectures when they're on WebEx. Uh, when I use Zoom, I have to record the lecture myself. And then I have to build the video file after that. And building the video file takes a long time because I think the 
the video form must be huge in my lecture for one and a half hours. So instead, I think that they are being recorded right now. Uh, Okay, this has been recorded right now by uh, the media space, and, and, and I'll send you the video link after they have been recorded. Okay, any other questions? No. No, then, then let's, uh, let's stop here then. I'm sorry for the hiccup again, and I hope that I wouldn't have this problem next time. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming and thank you for your patience and your the tolerance. Okay? Talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.